Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. As you probably know by now, we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the, four, the last four, uh, three months, the last quarter, the four, last three months of 2014. And that, of course, would be October, November, December. And this is the very last lesson in that series. It's a series on the book of James. And this particular lesson is entitled The Everlasting Gospel. And we're not going to just look at a part of James because it actually turns out James doesn't mention the word gospel at all. We're going to look at how the, uh, the message of James fits with the overall picture of Scripture. So this is lesson number 13 in that series for December 27. And before we get into it, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we offer a word of prayer, ask the Lord to guide us as we study together. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for your guidance for those who so many years ago wrote down the words which we now call Scripture. We know that James had a very key role in the early church and presumably helped to get it started and get it going. Now as we are coming closer to the end of Christian history on this world, help us to get the message that, or the messages that you want us to have and learn to, to, to speak more clearly about the truth so that we may lead others closer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm. James, it's a little book, five chapters. We're now coming to the end of that, and I, uh, as I already suggested, we're going to try to do a kind of summary. Um, what is the message of James? What does the rest of the book, Bible say about the gospel? Well, Revelation 14, 6 should be familiar to nearly all of our listeners. Look at that for a moment. Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. Now, of course, my translation is the good news translation, so when they come to the word gospel, which does mean good news, they translate it as good news. So we would say that this message, which we as Seventh-day Adventists has taken to be our, our special message to the world at this time in, in history, uh, when we see this message, um, we ask ourselves, okay, are we spreading that good news? What exactly are we doing? One thing about the word eternal gospel, it didn't start at some point and, and go on from there. It's always been that way. Mm -hmm. That's the way God runs the universe. If we look at it from that standpoint, it, was, it wasn't uh, uh, at a beginning. So, so there was no beginning to the good news? That's the way God runs things, is, is, is goodness and graciousness and uh, compassion and love. So, so the good news, the original good news would be the fact that God is the kind of person he is. Right. Isn't that all we need? Yeah. Well, the problem is, there's a lot, God has ha had to deal with a lot of misinformation this bit, uh, exactly. on, the part of, on the part of his creatures. And uh, the, 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 in that context, the, the question I would like to ask is, why are we so prone to believe the devil instead of believing God? <coughs> That's one of the questions we want to struggle with this evening. And it isn't just us at this point in, t in the history of the universe, or no. just the history of this world. We're, we're clear back at the beginning of the book, it talks about uh, creation with, with Adam and Eve, and uh, they listen to the serpent who tickles their ears. Mm -hmm. Well, we've we mentioned the everlasting gospel. That's in Revelation 14, 6. There are two other verses that we commonly look at in connection with Revelation 14, 6. Do you remember where they, where they are found? Well, let me, let me just rephrase that. There are three verses in the book of Revelation that we Adventists have taken as a kind of charter for us. Do you remember where they're found? 17. 12, 17, and 14, 12, and 19, 10, right? And how do we understand those verses? 
we believe that it says those three verses talk about those who keep the commandments of God. And of course, you know what we say about that. But also one says the faith of Jesus. The other one says the testimony of Jesus. And then the, the 1910 says for the testimony of Jesus. This is the King James Version. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And so we say that's our message. We have the spirit of prophecy. We refer to the writings of Ellen White as the spirit of prophecy. There are many other ways to translate those verses, of course. So let's come back to our basic question, since this is connected to all that, and look at Romans 1, 16 and 17, a very key verse many, many people have looked at and commented on. And Paul says this, um, in, again in my Good News translation, I have complete confidence in the gospel. That would be the good news. It is God's power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. For the gospel, now the question is, what is the gospel all about? That's our question. For the gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. It is through faith from beginning to end, as the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. Um, how do we understand that? Whenever I see the word salvation or save, I like to substitute the word health or heal, because if you understand that the problem of the sin is, is a disease, as opposed to a breaking of rules that offend somebody or, or a God. Well, when you, you talk about put right with God, what, what's happening there? We must be wrong with God at the beginning. So the question is, how does he put us right with himself? Mm -hmm. Well, he's been accused of being arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, exacting, severe. So we have a, a bad way of looking at it. We, our, our mind starts out with the wrong presupposition. So we need a healing of our mind. Well, so Romans 1.17 here. Are you going to comment, Gary? No. Romans 1.17 illustrates two very different understandings of the gospel. Let's look at that. I'm going to look at three different translations, or four different translations, and you'll see the the, the, the contrast. My Good News Bible said, for the gospel reveals how po God puts people right with himself. The Message Bible says, it's about God's way of putting people right. Now those two pretty much agree. The King James Version says, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. And my New American Standard Bible from 1995, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed. Now those two basic differences of translation are quite remarkably different. Why do you suppose that is? Presupposition on the part of the translator. And I've commented here, many Bible translators have struggled with how to interpret Romans 1.17. The Greek says simply, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. But without an understanding of the great controversy, they say, well, who, whoever questions the righteousness of God, we all know God is righteous. Who would dare to question that? And if you don't believe or understand anything about the great controversy, you don't know what to do. How, why would the gospel be about revealing the righteousness of God? I mean, we all accept that, right? Not everybody, obviously, just the Bible translators. And then yeah. many times Bible translations mistranslate some other passages. Yeah. And because they're, uh, they can't imagine that God would put himself on trial before anybody, let alone the whole universe. Yeah. So here they, they say, well, it can't be the righteousness of God. There must be some other way to understand this. It must be a righteousness of God. Well, what would a righteousness of God mean? Well, it must mean how God puts us right. That has to be the way. And so that's how we get to those very different translations. My version has got it a little different. I've never really seen it quite like this. For in, the, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. Mm -hmm. As it is written, the righteousness shall live by faith. Yeah. But it's the righteousness of God that's revealed yeah. from faith for faith. Because God has been accused. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you take the position that God is teaching, He's revealing, is making known, he's showing what he's really like, as opposed to coming and paying a penalty for a person and let them go on their, their own self-centered way, which is self-destruction. 
Let's look at those first accusations from the devil. Genesis 3, almost at the very beginning of the Bible. Now the snake was, most cunning, was the most cunning animal that the Lord God had made. The snake asked the woman, Did God really tell you not to eat fruit from any tree in the garden? We may eat the fruit of any tree in the garden, the woman answered, but except the tree in the middle of it, God told us not to eat the fruit of that tree or even to touch it. If we do, we will die. The snake replied, that's not true. You will not die. God said that because he knows that when you eat it, you will be like God and know what is good and what is bad. Okay? Is he questioning God's righteousness? Is he test testing, questioning whether or not God has told us the truth? Well, Satan, speaking through the serpent and the tree, accused God of lying. And all through Scripture, we, we see a storyline which tells us how various individuals and groups, especially the children of Israel, have responded to that truth about God. And this is what our lesson emphasizes. Look at Hebrews 4, verse 2. I'm going to read from the NIV first, and then I'm going to look at my Good News Bible. For we also have had the gospel preached to us just as they did. And of course, it's talking about the children of Israel back as they were coming out of Egypt in, in, in Hebrews 4. They heard the gospel, he says, but the message they heard was of no value to them because those who heard did not combine it with faith. My Good News Bible says, for we have heard the good news just as they did. They heard the message, but it did them no good because when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. So now, these two contrasting views of the gospel how would we decide which one is correct? Well, let's, let's try to, to, to outline the different views just as clearly and plainly and distinctly as we can before we make a choice. One view suggests that the good news is that when human beings sin, God demanded that someone pay the price for this infraction. Jesus offered to pay that price by his death. God said, you know, if you sin, you're supposed to die. Someone's got to die. Okay? So Jesus says, I'll do it. And God looked for thousands, of, waited for thousands of years until he finally got the right blood. Yes. The We're going to talk about the, that in a moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> As a result, God, perhaps reluctantly in some views, accepted the payment and agreed to save us. Okay, now I'm maybe caricaturing that a little bit, but that's basically what the teaching is. A second view suggests that from the beginning, the question has been, who is telling us the truth? Is it God or his great adversary? God has said that sin is deadly. The devil says, that's a lie. And there it is, Genesis 2, 17, Genesis 3, we just read it. So who is telling us the truth? Who can we trust? Now, if I just ask you, do you trust God or you trust the devil? What are you going to say? I mean, no one, be, no one who has a little, at least a little bit of orientation to Christianity is not going to say, well, I trust the devil. But the question is, how do we actually live our lives? Well, of course, wasn't the devil correct in what he said? Because Adam and Eve didn't die. Well, they did die finally. It's partially correct. That's what he does. He gives you <clears throat> enough to get you in. Yeah. Well, yeah, the devil doesn't want us. The devil doesn't tell blatant lies that everyone can, immediately, everyone can see immediately. This is a lie because what would happen? We would reject it. I mean, hopefully we would reject it. So what does he do? He's the deceiver. He, so he's he deceiver. sure coats the lie and makes it palatable. So, and now I'm going to ask you the tough question. Well, first of all, let's just say I believe, and you can decide whether you agree with this. We're going to talk about it. I believe that Jesus died, is the only one so far in history who died the actual death, which is a result from sin. The only one. He did not, did not die of beating. He did not die of blood loss. He didn't die of crucifixion. He died of sin. In fact, if we believe the writings of Ellen White, it says he fell dying to the ground while he was still in the Garden of Gethsemane and no one had touched him. No one had touched him, no one had beaten him, no one had crucified him. There was no blood, well, he's sweating blood, but uh, other than that, no blood loss. Okay? So, now, 
let's 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 be very practical about this. At the way, yeah. Maybe you better define what you what you mean by dying to this sin stuff. What what do you mean by that, well that I don't think okay. most of our listeners are understanding what you're fair enough fair implying enough. here or saying here or well this is the question and that's I mean if people don't understand it then that's proof that the devil's been pretty successful right a lot of Adventists listening here. I know, I know. So I'm, if, I'm talking. If they're, let's let's. Now, if they think, you know, you're not saying very good things about them. Well, let's think about this. <laughs> God said at the beginning, "If you sin, you will die." The devil said, "That's a lie." Now we could take a superficial approach of that and say, "Okay, how many human beings from the day of Adam to today are still alive?" Don't we all die sooner or later if, if, if the world, if, you know, the second coming keeps delaying more and more time? It's a given. So we say, okay, sin leads to death. But that's not what God was talking about. We die of auto accidents and heart attacks and cancer and strokes and all those kind of things. Those aren't sin per se. Aren't those the effects of sin? Well, yes. Consequences But I'm of talking sin? about a direct result of, Jesus, uh, of sin. And Jesus... What, 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 what about... What about the toads and the grass and the flowers? They didn't have anything to do with this no. sin thing. So That's right. How, how they're, judged, they're judged along with us because we are the master of this world. Whether that's fair, we'll discuss that with God when he comes. Okay. Now, when Jesus was, was dying in the garden, mm -hmm. when he was falling down, mm -hmm. I can't see where sin is actually doing that. I can only be told that sin is doing that. Yeah. So how am I supposed to really know that that sin was really doing, he, making God get weak, I mean, Jesus get weak and ready to die? Mm -hmm. The only, only thing that I can think of there, I've pondered this quite a bit over the years. He, Christ knew what he was here for by the time this was happening. He knew what was going on and what was entailed. I think it was the psychological effect of his brain realizing that this was it and that linked into his body and we we know you get really desperate like that your brain output will kill you we kind of interrupted you there in the middle of your explanation so yes go go on go on well um hold on just a second i'm going to see if i can my computer is misbehaving a little bit here um we're going i'm going to say i'm going to say this I'm going to say that, and, and there's plenty of verses in the Bible for this. In fact, some of them I think are found, no, they're found in actually the lesson we're going to study, be studying next week. Uh, let me just pick one real quick. So, um, Jesus' death wasn't a result of his own sin, because he was not a sinner, but it's collateral damage of living in, in a sinful environment. As a human being. As a human being. Yeah, it's a... Uh, got uh, to his limit, and that yeah. was it. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my, let me try this, this will, this will do the job. I don't think that's what Ken is saying. I think there's no, this Ken collateral is, damage stuff here. I think to me that's... Okay, here's, here's my key verses. Squirrels and rabbits too. Or something. Let, let's go to Acts 17. Paul is speaking to the people in Athens, okay? And he's given a sermon, and this is what he says. Nor does he, talk, he's talking about God, nor does he need anything that we can supply by working for him, since it is he himself who gives life and breath and everything else to everyone. And if you drop down to verse 28, as someone has said, in him we live and move and exist. It is as some of your poets have said, we too are his children. So if it is in him that we live and move and exist, what would happen if, we, if he withdrew himself, his presence from us? We would cease to exist. No, we're all dependent upon him for Sin us. leads to separation from God. So what happened in the garden, and you can read this very clearly in the book, Great, uh, in the book Desire of Ages in the chapter uh, on Calvary. I'm sorry, the chapter on Gethsemane. It's in Calvary as well, but in Gethsemane we're talking about now. And it says God is withdrawing his beams of light and love away from Christ. And he died as a human being because God withdrew himself from him. 
and that happened again on Calvary. But so now, in our case, God does not withdraw from us. We withdraw from Him. From Him. Yes. But we're, gonna, we're, we're talking about the death which results from sin. When it, we, I just said a little while ago that the only time that's happened so far in history was the death of Christ. Is it ever going to happen again? The end of the thousand years. At the end of the millennium, with all the wicked outside the city there, what's going to happen? God is going. To, those people out there are basically going to say, "God, we chose to rebel, reject you, to rebel against you. Leave us alone." And God will say, "Okay, if that's your attitude." So what if I do that now? What if I don't wait till then? You try to reject. God won't accept your, you, if you just stand up, you know, a lot of people have stood up on the stairs like the Supreme Court and says, if God is real and live, strike me dead right now. Well, God's not going to do that. And then they say, well, there's no God. I mean, of <laughs> course, the simpletons. So, here's the question now. Is the good news that Jesus has paid the price for our salvation? And technically, that's true of both views. But the other view says, is the good news primarily that God is not the kind of person his enemies have made him out to be? Because as, as Jim has already pointed out, the devil has just said all kinds of awful things about God. So let's, let's move on. Let's look back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31. The Lord says, the time is coming when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors and when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt. Although I was like a husband to them, they did not keep that covenant. The new covenant that I will make with the people of Israel will be this. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. None of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. Okay? Notice it says here that when we get to know the Lord, it will transform us. How does that work? Heal. Heal our thinking about Him. Heal us. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a transformation, isn't it? If, if you're sick and you're... Do, do we believe that by beholding we become changed? Isn't that a transformation? Right. Right. Uh, something happens to our... Well, we use the word heart, I mm -hmm. guess. Something happens to our... Deepest thinking? Our, our focus, our thought, our urgings, our... our mm -hmm. Something... We're... So, we're... we're kind of impressed to, to do something else. So now the question is, who is, it, who, who, who is God going to take home to live with Him forever? And what are the criteria Teachable. for those people? Teachable people. Teachable? Anything else? Trustworthy. Trustworthy? <clears throat> Absolutely. People who will never choose to rebel against Him. It's safe to have them there. That's what God is looking for. He says, I, I can know you so well, I can say by looking at you now whether it's going to be safe to have you in heaven. Why can't he have a little corner over away from heaven? and Save everybody? Well, just maybe a place for me and you, and all the good people can be someplace else. Why? I think that's what's Why, do, why do we have to, uh, if we're not safe to have in heaven, why can't he have a place where it's not safe to have? It's called hell. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's exactly, that's exactly right. I mean, God could save everybody. All He would have to do is turn heaven into a, into a, a, a solitary confinement prison. He put everybody in his own little cubicle so we couldn't hurt each other, we couldn't lead each other astray, and then the angels would come around once or twice a day and stuff some food in the little cubicle so you could have something to eat. Well, they probably have a, just have a choot that's automatic. Shoot, yeah, automatic. Yeah, the, pro <laughs> the problem is that is already in the theology of one or two of the main churches we all know. It's already there, just what you said. But this you have to pay to get out. This teaching on the, or the, on the Satan say, or the serpent says that you're not going to die, and those that have studied the Bible, many of them, which where you get a lot of churches, and they have this teaching about hell. It's got a, God's going to roast them and toast them on a spit in the sky by and by mm -hmm. for eternity. Well, the question is now, 
Is it true that the best news of all is that God doesn't do that to people? That he's made some kind of a legal arrangement to pay for our sins? Or is it that we've discovered that God is totally and completely loving and that he can hardly wait to welcome us home? Look, look at these verses. You, you know these verses. 1 John 4, 8. His disciples, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, i got to put a one in front of this. Give me just a second. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And in case you didn't hear it, it goes down eight verses later. later and we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love. And those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. I mean, what are we saying about that kind of person? If, we're, if, we're, if people are scared to death of him, there's, they're petrified. We're going to talk about that next week. Uh, you know, how did that happen? We don't know? Well, there was the flood. There was Sodom and Gomorrah. Those are kind of mm -hmm. things that could do that. Yes. Sorry, my computer is okay. So we got the flood. We got Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, we got the prophets of Baal. He wasn't real happy with them, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Killed. But our lesson suggests that some people have a hard time finding the gospel in the gospels. Jesus came to, let's think about this, a tithe-paying, health-reforming, Sabbath-keeping, law-abiding, quote, end quote, group of people, didn't he? Yes. If you had asked them, do they do all those things? Absolutely. And they were very what, proud of it. Yeah, they were very proud of it. What further could they possibly need, right? And they believed a Messiah was coming. Yes. So they were Adventists. Yes. But unfortunately, and now I'm going to read some words that are virtually never quoted because people don't know what to do with these words. These are from Ellen White. They were written in, in, in the Signs of the Times on January 20 of 1890. The law of Jehovah, this is talking about in preparation for the, second, for the first coming of Jesus. The law of Jehovah was burdened with needless exactions and traditions. We know that they had found 613 laws just in the five books of Moses, okay? God was represented as severe, exacting, revengeful, and arbitrary, okay? That's the way they viewed God. He was pictured as one who could take pleasure in the sufferings of his creatures. The very attributes that belonged to the character of Satan, the evil one represented as belonging to the character of God. So devil has been very successful at convincing us that the one who's all these evil things is not him, but God. Okay? So, what did Jesus come to do? Jesus came to teach men of the Father, to correctly represent him before the fallen children of earth. So if you have a false picture over here that's being portrayed by the devil and perpetrated by his, his group, and over here you have Jesus, and what's Jesus doing by, in contrast? Correctly representing him. Correctly representing the Father. Angels could not fully portray the character of God, but Christ, who was a living impersonation of God, could not fail to accomplish the work. Why do you suppose that's true? Couldn't angels do a pretty good job of representing God? They, the angels created haven't been being. accused. They're created beings. Yes. So there's a little difference there. And angels haven't been accused. Yeah. yeah. So. If, you, if I accuse Gary, for example, say, you did this and this and this, the question is not about Jim or, or Jay or Johnny. The question is about Gary. So if I want to know the truth about Gary, I have to find out what kind of person Gary is, whether he would do such a thing, right? So I, I can't ask somebody else. Now, I might ask Carrie over here, okay, do you know this Gary guy? What do you know about him? You know, can he be trusted? You, know, you can get some information, but... To really know about Gary, I need, to, I need to see Gary himself. So the only way in which he, that's Jesus, could set, and another word for that is justify, and keep, another word for that is sanctify, men right. Now it says the only way 
in which he could set and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Let's think about that for a moment. The only way in which he could set... Now remember, the, the, the usual teaching is that the way God sets people right is by paying the price. Okay? Well, you can, you can still use that term, pay a price. Mm -hmm. The problem is, what is the process? Yeah. Because he did pay a price by leaving heaven and coming to live as, as among creatures, human beings, as a, as a human being. Yeah. Uh, that was the price, but not a, well, a pagan concept of, of paying a penalty for somebody. Yeah. Well, and, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but you start thinking about it now. If Jesus paid the price, to whom did he pay it? Yeah. And who demanded it? It's illogical. Be because if you say that, then you have God and Jesus being separated. Jesus doing something to appease the Father's wrath, that's a very common expression. To appease the Father's wrath. You, what you're doing is you're dividing, you're dividing up the Godhead. It's, it's, you have one member of the Godhead fighting against another member. That's craziness. It is. Well, Christ exalted the character of God attributing to him the praise and giving to him the credit of the whole purpose. Now, up here it said what? The only way he could set and just and, and keep men right was to make himself visible and familiar to their eyes. Now it says the whole purpose of his mission on earth was to pay the price. What does it say that? The whole purpose of Christ's mission on earth was to set men right through the revelation of God. In Christ was arrayed before men, the paternal grace and the matchless perfections of the Father. In his prayer, just before his crucifixion, he declared, I have manifested thy name, John 17, 6. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do, John 17, 4. In his prayer to the Father, he said this. When the object of his mission was attained, what was the object of his mission now? reveal the truth about the Father. The revelation of God to the world. The Son of Man announced that his work was accomplished. Now, he hasn't, he hasn't even died yet. His work was accomplished in that the character of the Father was made manifest to men. Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890. Now, to many people who hold that other view, this is rank heresy. This is the worst possible misrepresentation of God. Well, let's ask some questions about it. Did Jesus come primarily to pay the price for sin, or did he come to set men right to the revelation of God? Or is there a way that both of those can be true? And I think it's the by the revelation of God, you mean, we mean what? Well, if we, so if what we God believe... what is really like. Yeah, exactly. If we go back and read Genesis 1 to 3, God said, sin leads to death. The devil says, that's not true. Who are we going to believe? Do we, have, do we have adequate reason, adequate evidence for believing God's statement? And then, of course, I have to add as the next, the toughest question is, do we live as if we believe that statement? Do we believe, do we live every day based on the idea that sin leads to death? There's a couple of parables, that, a couple of stories, and the many parables um, that, we're, that the lesson talks about. There, Jesus went on to say, there was once a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the property now. So the man divided his property between his two sons. Now, this is the younger son. What do we know about the, the way they divided property in, in those days? <coughs> Went to the eldest son, didn't it? The eldest son got a double portion. Why did he get a double portion? His job was to take care of the parents. His responsibility was to take care of his parents when they got old. So that's why the older son got a double portion. So now the younger son in this story would get how much? One third, right? So the man divided his property between his two sons. After a few days, the younger son sold his part of the property and left home with the money. He went to a country far away where he wasted his money on reckless living. He spent everything he had. Then a severe famine spread over that country and he was left without a thing. 
So he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him out to his farm to take care of the pigs. Now think about a Jew who's <laughs> out there taking care of pigs. Okay? He wished he could fill himself with the bean pods that pigs ate, but no one gave him anything to eat. At last he came to a census and said, all my father's hired workers have more than they can eat, and here I am about to starve. I will get up and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servant workers. So he got up and started back to his father. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was filled with pity and he ran, threw his arms around his son and kissed him. Have you ever asked yourself how did he manage to recognize him in that mess? Well, Father, the son said, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. But the father called his servants. Hurry, he said, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. What did the ring on the finger mean? This wasn't just display of some kind. Signet ring? This was the signet ring. If you wanted to sign a check at the bank, you use the signet ring. Then go and get the prize calf and kill it and let us celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. And so the feasting began. In the meantime, the elder son was out in the field. On his way back, when he came close to the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him, What's going on? Your brother has come back home, the servant answered, and your father has killed the prize calf because he got him back safe and sound. The elder brother was so angry that he would not go into the house. So his father came out and begged him to come in. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have worked for you like a slave, and I have never disobeyed your orders. What have you given me? Not even a goat for me to have a feast with my friends. But this son of yours wasted all your property on prostitutes, and when he comes back home you kill the prize calf for him. My son, the father answered, You are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be happy because your brother was dead, but now he's alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. So why were they celebrating? Because the, the loss was found. Yeah. Okay. It was it for the benefit of the of the of the son, or was it the benefit of the father? Well, probably both. I think the older son was he, he had a streak in him that wasn't necessarily too good. Let me, just, let me just let me just read it. the way the son described is, is described as kind of like he lived in sullen submission for yeah, a long yes, period of exactly. time. Jesus also told this parable to people who are sure of their own goodness. Yeah. Would that be like the older brother? And despised everyone else, everybody else. Once there were two men who went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. Now we all know that the Pharisees were saints, right? The Pharisee stood apart by himself and prayed, I thank you, God, that I'm not greedy, dishonest, or an adulterer like everybody else. I thank you that I am not like that tax collector over there. I fast two days a week, and I give my, you a tenth of all my income. By the way, you may or may not know that there were seven groups even among the Pharisees. One of those groups was called the Bruised and Bleeding Pharisees. Have you heard of the Bruised and Bleeding Pharisees? Yeah. Why were they called Bruised and Bleeding Pharisees? They wore a burqa over their face. Yeah, they? they thought it was it would, might be it would be a sin to see someone else's wife. So they wore a, a, a complete covering. So and and they would run into things and bruise themselves. So they were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because they were, they were the saints. Okay. Well, but the tax collector stood at a distance and would not even raise his face to heaven, but beat on his breast and said, "God, have pity on me, a sinner." I tell you, said Jesus, the tax collector and not the Pharisee was in the right with God when he went home. For all who make themselves great will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be made great. So, who are the surprising characters in each of these stories? Of course, you know we're still talking about God here, so. Who are the surprising characters? In the, in the story of the prodigal son, who is a surprising character? The father. The father. Okay, of course. He runs. 
He sees his son way down the road. He runs as fast as he can get go. He puts his arms around him. He's still holding him. He says, quick, grab a robe and put it around this guy. He doesn't want anybody to see his son in that mess, right? What an incredible situation. And who's the surprising man, the person in the other parable? The tax collector. The tax collector, yeah. right. And he, he goes home justified, as, 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 this, as the parable says. The Pharisee was the typical, I was conceited, now I'm perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the prodigal's re-exposure to the father was transformational for him. He, he could not believe the reception he got. Do you think that's going to be true of us when we suddenly find ourselves accompanying God on our way to heaven? We're going to say, this, we're pinching ourselves. This can't be true. This, this, this is our God, right? The tax collector's prayer before God was transformational for him. But the main character in both of these stories, of course, is God the Father. Well, look at Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood, Jesus says, which seals God's covenant. My blood poured out for many for the transgression of sins. What does that mean? Look at Mark 10, 45. Similar verse. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. Okay? So our, our lesson goes on to say, and here's the question. That, that, that word redeem, yeah. that kind of... Sounds like someone's paying something to get it back, right? Right, yeah. yeah. yeah no, so no wonder well, we think these things. Thus, and I'm quoting, thus, comma, salvation is free to us because he, Jesus, paid the full price for it. When you read a statement like that, shouldn't you ask the question, what was the price? To whom was it paid? Where do you think you would fit in these two parables? Right? So let me ask those first two questions. What was the price he paid, and to whom was it paid? Is God demanding his pound of flesh? No. No? Well, not in that brutal sense, I don't think. No, it's like... So is God, does God owe something to the devil? Back in the early days of Christianity, believe it or not, they had a view of salvation that went like this. There were a lot of kidnappers in those days, and, and the, 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 the wealthy people had to protect their, even their children when they were going to school and back for fear somebody would kip, kidnap them and demand, because there were 60% of the people in the Mediterranean world in those days were slaves. And if you kidnap someone with a, the kid of someone with a lot of money, you could demand a lot of money, pay your way out of slavery, and you'd be free. Okay? So the idea was that when we sinned as human beings in the plan of salvation, this is what they taught, we, have, we sold ourselves into the hands of Satan. So Satan's holding us. And God comes along and says to Satan, I'll make you a deal. I will give you Jesus in exchange for all these sinners. And Satan says, well... I've always wanted to be in the place of Jesus. That's what I wanted most of all. This sounds like a good deal. So he agrees with God, I'll take Jesus and I'll give you all the sinners. God gets all the sinners, the devil takes Jesus. The only problem is he can't hold on to Jesus and Jesus escapes. So God wins the great controversy by tricking the devil. You like that version of the story? <laughs> Seems a little nebulous. <laughs> <laughs> Seems a little funny, doesn't it? Well, how do, how do we put this all together? Look, look, at, look at 2 Corinthians 3, 14 to 16. Their minds indeed were closed. This is talking about the people in Corinth. And to this very day, their, I'm sorry, in the Old Testament. And to this very day, their minds are covered with the same veil as they read the books of the Old Covenant. The veil is removed only when a person is joined to Christ. Even today, whenever they read the Law of Moses, the veil still covers their minds. But it can be removed... As the scripture says about Moses, his veil was removed when he turned, return, well, when he turned to the Lord. What's the veil? Well, we know that at the time of the Damascus Road, Revelation, or 
there's fancy names for it, but it's called a revelation. Paul experienced a fruit basket upset in his thinking. It took him nearly three years to sort it all out. And in, in the only place where in the entire Bible where someone sits down and tries to seriously explain why Jesus had to die is found in Romans 3, 25 and 26. Let's take a careful look at it, okay? Romans 3, 25 and 26. God offered him so that by his blood, and another way of translating that is, the, the, the word for blood is not in there. Uh, another way of translating that is sacrificial death. The word is hilasterion, which means Martin Luther translated it as a mercy seat uh, or a gnadstuhl in German, and, and uh, um, Tyndall brought it over in English as a mercy seat. Uh, the word actually was a word used in the Old Testament to describe that little plate of gold that sat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And if you think about it, what was underneath that plate of gold? In the box. The Ten Commandments that had been broken. And what was above the plate of gold? Angel or cherubim or whatever. Well, the cherubim on the side, who was in the middle? God's, God's presence. God's Shekinah presence. So who's going to stand between the broken law and God's Shekinah presence? It's that lid. And the Jews still celebrate that because oh, Yom Kippur Yom Kippur is the day of the lid. That's what Yom Kippur means. As a means of reconciliation or a place of atonement, or, or A place of reconciliation. Together. Somehow or other you have to bring the broken law back into reconciliation with God. Uh, and a bunch of sinners who have broken the law. In a way, though, that word reconciliation implies that at one time there was a we were in a state we of together. conciliation, which we, we really weren't. At least, to, well, in Adam and Eve's day, maybe. Yeah, prior to, prior to their sin, but but so you can't be reconciled if you were not previously yeah. in the state of conciliation. So maybe. So let's there. look at this now. God offered him so that by his sacrificial death, his blood, the hilasterion. He should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in Him. God did this in order to demonstrate. Why did God send Jesus? Why did He have to die? To demonstrate that He is righteous. To demonstrate what? Righteousness of God. That He is righteous. Or if you read, read the original uh, Greek, it's he, the righteousness of God. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins. But in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous. It's another way of demonstrating his righteousness. And that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. And then finally, that he does something about us. So we see here that three times, God has to say, I'm righteous, I'm righteous, I'm righteous, and oh, by the way, I, I can make you righteous too. What you have highlighted in yellow there, that mm -hmm. it, is that really the, the idea of that people's sins are forgiven by that process? I, well, that, it's, that's no, kind that, of a distortion of the, a, re, a reading into something that is really not there. Let's, let's, let's look at here. But that's what it says. That's the problem of, of Bible translators. They've given us some wrong information. Yeah, that's several times you said that there's, I can't read this thing. I know. It's, that's why we're good to have people that understand the Greek and, and we can share it with us. Well, here, here's, here's a very traditional translation. Look at the New American Standard Bible. Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. Propitiation means someone is angry and someone has to assuage that anger. That is paganism. Right on. And what version is that? That's the New American Standard Bible. The King James, King says, James the says the same thing. I'll read. Maybe I should read you the, the King Bishop's James. Bible. Let, the let's Rem let's go to the King James. Version. Telling me these Bibles are telling me the wrong thing. Yes. Well, there it's 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 misunderstood. That's the problem. It's not. But the, we're stuck. But the people that are reading the Greek and the Hebrew and Arabic and they're reading that and they're misinterpreting and so they're because I can't be, how much of this am I going to be confused by their presuppositions well their because point they of view. know nothing about the great controversy oh so, my goodness well <laughs> let me read the King James being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ 
whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness, there's one time, for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the word just is just another way of translating righteousness, and the justifier, finally, of him who which believeth in Jesus. So pick your translation. Three times it says, God has to be proven to be right before he can do anything at all for us. This is the only verse, the only passage in the Bible where anyone is intentionally set out to try to explain why Jesus had to die. Do we need to take that seriously? And we'll go back to uh, Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 16 and 17, yeah, we just, the, which yeah. we did earlier. Yeah. Uh, the righteousness of God, because if it is a law of human nature, you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. And you learn through what your, goes through your eyes and what you hear. And then the ultimate demonstration was Jesus 2,000 years ago. Well, Paul says very clearly three times in those, that key verse that God came, Jesus came to demonstrate the righteousness of God. Now, how, what does that have to do with paying a price to assuage God's anger? It doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. Well, do we really need to see the truth about God demonstrated before we can come to really fully trust Him? Well, Jesus said that's what He came here for. And, and we read the passage. Are, are we ready to do that? How do we get to know God better? Well, look at some passage in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 7.19 for the law of Moses could not make anything perfect, and now a better hope has been provided through which we come near to God. Okay? A better hope has been provided through which we come near to God. And then the, the real key verse is found in Hebrews 10, 1 to 4. The Jewish law is not a full and faithful model of the real things. Now, what we have tended to do is said, okay, we have this sandbox demonstration from the desert out there at the foot of Mount Sinai. That must be a complete plan of salvation, and we have taken it apart and identified every little detail. But look at what this says. It is only a faint outline of the good things to come. The same sacrifices are offered forever, year after year. How can the law then, by means of these sacrifices, make perfect the people who come to God? Now let's think about that for a moment. If you had a way. You, you, you bring your lamb, let's say, for example, you come to the tabernacle, you, you slit the lamb's throat, the blood is poured out, and you say, okay, now I'm, my sins are gone, I'm, I'm taken care of, right? Well, if that really worked and really made a difference, really changed us, it should never need to happen again. One time should be enough, right? But what do we know? They came back and back and back and back because they because of what because they kept on sinning. Is it kind of true that um, you know the whole thing, this whole sacrifice thing with the, the lamb, was symbolic for something? Yeah. Then after a while, it started becoming literal to them that mm. it actually this is actually what happens when you sacrifice a lamb that it, it takes away your sin. Mm -hmm. But um, he. The Paul's pointing out that no, this is just symbolic because it doesn't really take away your sin. Look, it has to happen over and over again. Yeah. So now the question is this. Many people think that the answer now is that they were offering the wrong blood. That the lambs just never could do it. So now we have the blood of Jesus and that takes care of it. Is the problem in the Old Testament that they had the wrong blood? They were using the blood God told them to use. Yeah. Well, is there something magical about the blood of Jesus? Well, we go back to our statement. Back in the Garden of Eden, God had said that sin leads to death. Genesis 2.17. The deaths of Jesus. I Notice I said pearl. The deaths of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross demonstrated that fact. Look at Desire of Ages, page 693, first paragraph. <clears throat> Could we ask for any clearer demonstration? If we look at the death of Jesus and we say, yes, 
We've looked at it carefully, and we do believe that sin leads to death. So Jesus, Jesus assumed <clears throat> somehow the guilt of all the sins of everyone, and therefore he was separated because of those sins, and so he died. Well, does, is that necessary? Does, does he have to assume the sins of a whole bunch of people? Or can he just demonstrate what, do, what sin does to people? I don't think he has to actually assume anybody else's sins. He doesn't have any sins. The Bible says clearly he was not a sinner, but God treated, second, first Corinthians, treated him as a sinner. You can't move sins around. Well, but, I mean, I die too. Why can't that prove that, that sin the death is a because you don't die of, of directly of sin. That's the point. The point is we need to look at the story of Jesus and realize that when he died, he died of sin. You die of a heart attack or cancer or stroke or or something else like that or an auto accident. So he died simply because God just withdrew and and that's exactly what happened. Well, where where does the blood come in at then? Whether well, it's the blood is a symbol, a symbol of life, and it's gone. The, you die. That's that's where that's where the blood comes in. So, so Jesus's blood is different than the blood of the lamb. Well, it doesn't have to be different in that sense. Life when the so when the lamb loses its blood, it dies. Could, when Jesus loses his blood, he dies. Why couldn't they put me on the cross and and then they just just well, say, well, well, uh, I'm going to withdraw from Jay, and yeah. you can see what's going to happen. That would work for maybe answer one tiny little question. There's a, I mean, we could be here all night and tomorrow and the next day talking about all the other questions that had to be answered by the life and death of Jesus. Well, one thing, he can't raise himself. Exactly. That's the other part of the question. Jesus rose in his own power on Sunday morning. Do you think you could do that? I can hardly get up on a Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we're running out of time. Um, I hope that you got a little hint uh, of, of the challenges that we face when we try to explain the gospel to people based on the great controversy idea. Um, we need to find, God needs to find a group of people who are so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, this truth, that they cannot be moved. And when he finds a group of people like that, he will be able to wind up the great controversy, finish things here on this earth, and come and take us home to live with him forever. I hope you've found some questions that you can think about over the next few days. Our kind and loving Father, we ask that this lesson, which is of such import, might uh, touch a chord with some who are listening and lead them back to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.